The motion picture you're about to see is the performance research on saddles. It seems incredible how little riders or saddle makers know about the facts that make a saddle rideable. Here are the facts as only motion pictures could produce them. First, let us analyze bareback rodeo contesting. Hanging on to his rigging with one hand, the contestant not only has to stay on top of the world's roughest horses, he has to move his legs in a spurring motion with every jump. Guy Weeks gets two feet on the same side, then back a straddle and he keeps a raking. The bareback rigging is placed well forward on top of the horse's withers. Rider has to scoot up under his handhold, which would make him sit around the horn if he were riding a saddle. Peaks, the first fella I noticed who deliberately go back to make his ride look even wilder. Most top boys, including champion Jim Houston, have adopted this technique. Here's the great Jim Shoulders, seven times world champion bull rider, a rodeo producer and rodeo school owner of Henrietta, Oakland. Laying back, even as champion Paul Mayo does here, he's still riding around the horse's withers, over the horse's front legs. But bareback and bull riders are not the only ones to hang on to the horn by the, the saddle horn. It seems that every time we stand up, we have to steady ourselves by taking hold of the saddle horn. Even on straightaway runs, like hazing for a dogger, the rider, when standing, hangs on to the saddle horn. The rider on the gray horse, Aubrey Rankin, was killed when a steer cut across in front. As we show in this film, horses can run faster when the rider is off his seat, closer to the horse's withers and his front legs. This is Gary Foreman, age 12, on Aka, Reserve National Working Arabian Champion in 1961. Note the changes of leads. And bareback and even without a bridle. How about that? Gary is up against and around the withers with his legs. The rider's legs fit into an indentation where the horse's shoulders connect to his rib cage, right over where his front legs and elbows are. Slip out of this rider's groove on the horse's barrel causes loss of security, and you have to grab a handful of mane to stay on get too far forward, and his withers hurt you in the crotch. Bareback rodeo contestants hang on over the rider's groove. The rider's legs hang naturally on the, at the horse's elbows. Next is riding for speed. Here's a 14-ounce race saddle. Note that the stirrups are hung in front of the girt. The stirrups are hung in front of the girt, not behind it like on stock saddles. When the stirrups are hung up front this way, the rider is carried over the rider's groove, withers and front legs, even more forward than when the rider is bareback. The pony boy rides sitting, but the race rider stands. There's a lot of difference in where the weight is being carried on the horse's back. Jockeys do not sit down. At times, their seats touch the saddle, but with little weight, they hunker down to break, break the wind resistance. Weight is on their stirrups and knees, which puts them still farther forward over the horse's fore, forequarters in front of the girth. Jockeys used to sit down and ride with long stirrups until around 1885. Our American jockey, Todd Sloan, is mostly credited 
for shortening his stirrups, standed hunkered over the horse like a they laughed at Sloan, but he won so many races that other riders had to change to Sloan's style to get back in the competition. Todd Sloan proved that horses could carry weight on and in front of the girth easier and run faster with the rider's weight off his seat. Thus far, no one in the world has come up with a way to get more speed than by hovering over the horse's withers over the rider's groove. And of course, that includes roping, cutting, and other forms of riding too. Now let's analyze jumping saddles. The saddle rigging has little bulk. The stirrups are hung in front of the girt, same as on race saddles. Seat is the built up behind, lowest part is in the center, and it has a good deep knee roll. Stirrups hang directly at the horse's elbows. The girt sets about three inches in back of the elbows, farther to the rear, and the saddle would turn over. Any farther front makes girth sores. Here's the fabulous Jimmy Williams teaching at Flintridge Country Club in California. Jump riders get their security from their legs, from the knee down through the bottom of their calves, not hanging on with their hands. Their style of riding has been called a forward seat, but like many things in horsemanship, it's misnamed and misleading. As in race riding, the seat is in the air. Riders do not even sit down when they land after a jump. How could it be logically called a forward seat? It's riding securely balanced where the horse can carry and balance the rider best. That's balanced riding. Jimmy raises the jumps to five feet. To jump safely at above three feet usually takes lots of training and experience for both horse and rider. Here's Wendy Mars being coached by Jimmy Williams. Note that Wendy does not sit down at any time from the approach through the landings. Wendy's sister Mary is on our U.S. equestrian team and is married to another outstanding team member, Mr. Frank Chapeau. Jimmy Williams is not only outstanding as a jump trainer, on stock horses, he's won more hackamore and spade bridle championships than anyone since the California Stock Horse Association was formed. He is one of the greatest horsemen of all times. Like race and jump saddles, the polo saddle also has the stirrups in front of the girth without bulk under the rider's knees. When the rider stands, he's also carried over the rider's groove above the horse's elbows. Incredibly, even many high gold polo players are not very good at riding and handling, but most of them are mounted on those exceptional and wonderful horses that play well in spite of contradictory riding and handling. Four reins and a whip in one hand and a war club in the other. The main thing is to get in the game. And what a game. I played for 20 years, and to me, it's still the greatest of the horse games. Some fellers sit down, some stand up, but at least they don't hang on to the saddle horn with their hands to stay there. Look for the blue number three on the sorrel mare. He's a professional trainer and a pretty good calf roper too. He rolls back, stands up and hits. He keeps standing and then hits again. Then he gets bumped hard. He don't have to grab the saddle horn like we have to do on our counterfeit riding stock saddles. Here's Gary Foreman on to Kaz Lady 81. Technically, this is not English riding or an English saddle. This is a foreman-designed versatile polo bit. 
This is flat saddle riding, but few riders anywhere have ever seen changes of leads done on call this easily. He's changing the hind feet first, every third stride. One, two, three. One, two, three. Notice that the hind feet are changing first. Now he's changing every two strides. One, two, one, two, one, two. How about that? This in regular motion shows the timing and rhythm it takes. A versatile speed basic handle is the same on flat saddle horses as on stock saddle horses. These are inside rolls and out in the opposite lead. Left lead, left lead, left lead, left lead, out in the right lead. Right lead, right lead, out in the left lead. Whoa, horse. The next are roll backs. Left lead, right lead. Right lead, roll to the left lead. Left lead, roll to the right lead. Okay, let's mix them up. A left lead, 360 over the hock. A roll back to the right. A right lead, 360 over the hocks. Roll back to the left lead. A left lead, double, 360 over the hocks. A right roll back with a 360 on top of it. Oh, you don't get patterned, soured horses this way. Even the galloping spins are done in rhythm and leads. In performance research, we can find no differences, basically, between riding a flat saddle or a stock saddle. Oh, there's the ham of the Foreman family. Now let's check the riding qualities of a rodeo cowboy's bronc riding contest saddle. Stirrups are hung farther forward than on any other saddle in the world. The bulk of the rigging ring is back of the rider's leg, not under his knee. The fender leather is even cut out in front to get it closer to the swell. The front stirrup leather is tied to the front of the tree bars and allows the rider to stroke from shoulder to the cantleboard without letting his knees run away to the rear. Contestants place the saddle way up on top of the horse's withers. The girth crowds the horse's elbows, which ordinarily would rub a cinch sore in a hurry. The stirrup hang almost to the front of the horse's front legs. Ordinarily, a saddle could not be ridden on top of the withers without making them sore, but a contest ride is only for 10 seconds, and the rider is off in around 30 seconds. Now let's study the way a saddle bronc is ridden. Here's three times world champion Marty Woods. Notice how Marty's tail comes out of the saddle as he spurs in rhythm with every jump, going full stroke from the shoulder to the cantle board with both feet. The rigging knot is behind his leg and helps keep his knees in the same place. That's where the security is. Marty is an ex-jump rider turned saddle bronc rider. Here comes another champion, Alvin Nelson. The same balanced rhythm, tail out of the saddle with each stroke. Notice that his saddle has not been jerked to the rear, and then check how much forward the stirrups are than on a regular saddle. Here's the fabulous Casey Tibbs. Look at his style beautiful balance and rhythm. 
This is balanced riding as no one has done before on Bronx. Seven times saddle Bronx champion, bareback champion one year, and all around champion of the world one year. Here's another great champion, Kenny McLean's high point ride at the Denver National Western. Look at him go to the kennel with both feet and throw his buck rein with each jump. That's beautiful rhythm. Contrary to general belief, the contest rider does not stay sitting in the saddle. He rides basically like a jump rider. Here's the Bronc contest saddle on a riding horse. It has to move, be moved back off of the withers. This makes the girth go too far to the rear of the horse's elbows, which will let the saddle turn over. However, the stirrups are now under the rider's groove at the horse's elbow, the same place as race polo and jump stirrups. The rigging knot behind the rider's knee keeps the lower leg from getting under the rider's weight as it should. Her feet are too far forward, and it'll make her ride on her seat too heavily. When trying to stand, she has to lean too far forward, which makes her tail bob excessively. This puts both she and the horse into a strain. She's trying to catch up with her feet, causing the horse to think she wants him to go like 90. She rolls back here and then does another roll back. There's an inside roll and out the other lead. And another one. And then she gets a real good balanced stop. In the rider's groove with stirrups hung up front, she can stand with security during a stop. With the rigging rings, laddie go wraps, and knots behind her legs, there's no bulk under her knees, and it's less battle to stay a straddle on a bronc rider's saddle. Next, let's analyze stock saddles, like most of us have been brought up a ride. This one's about average in looks and rideability. The seat is lowest in the rear. Front is built up, which hurts you in the crotch, adds about five pounds to your saddle weight, and the stirrups are hung back of a bulky D-rigging. The girth is in the right place behind the horse's elbows, but the stirrups are hung in back of the girth. Look at all the bulk, pads, buckles, and leather thicknesses under the rider's legs. Right where the knee down through the calf needs to be next to the horse's side for security. That's where the rideability is. Let's check the bulk under the rider's leg in leather thickness of, uh, say, one eighth of an inch each. The bulky D rigging on top of the skirts plus laddie go tie and two wraps makes about two inches. The saddle pads and blanket, two more inches. A couple more inches in stiff, unmovable fenders and leathers. That makes three to five inches more than the half inch bulk under the contest bronc rider's knees. The more latigo wraps makes more bulk. Compared to the association saddles bulk, you have the equivalent of more than an extra two before stuck under each leg. Here's a saddle with the rigging built into the skirts. It eliminates some bulk, but the rigging is too low, causes weaknesses and complications. The stirrups, are also hung behind the girth to the rear of the rider's groove. The low rigging and latigo wraps set right under the rider's knee where it hurts, and the bone cannot absorb any of the bulk. When trying to stand, the rider loses security because his stirrups get too far back and run away from him. Let's analyze hanging the stirrups out of the seat this way behind the girth. You pull them to the rear and they go way back into the horse's flanks. That alone can get you bucked off. When you try to stand, your feet fly back out from under your weight 
and you either fall forward on your face or have to grab the saddle horn to get some security. To stand up and have any security, especially to pull on a horse's head when he's running, is just about impossible because you fall forward or you have to sit down and rear back. Now let's uh, analyze our riding style, especially with a little speed on stirrups that run away to the rear. The girl's feet get all the way back into the horse's front flanks. She rides loosely, her feet and legs flop, looks like a loose pack on a pack horse. Seems to have no knee contact or leg grip to give her security. Here's another saddle with the stirrups hung too far to the rear. Where's his security while running? Every time he turns, he has to grab the saddle horn. Note how much his legs flop around. Yep, on saddles with counterfeit riding qualities, there's too much bulk under the rider's knees, and combined with run backward stirrups, it leaves him needing a handhold for sure. How about this for a beautiful riding style? Guide with one hand, hang on to the saddle horn with the other, and knock the wind out of them with both feet. Think about the beautiful rhythm and riding style of top contest bronc riders. Then look at this strained hanging on. Put the bronc rider on this saddle, though, and they'd have the same battle to stay astraddle. That bulk under their knees and stirrups hung too far back. All of us have been taught to lean toward the way a horse is turning. But if we do, as you see here, it causes the horse to run wider on the turn. The horse even has to change to the wrong lead to support her weight. To help the horse stay straight up, notice she's also lost her stirrups. This little girl keeps losing her stirrups, too. Here goes her left stirrup, and she has to grab the saddle horn to get it back. On the third barrel, she jerks both feet out of her stirrups, and note where her legs go, up into the rider's groove in front of her stirrups. It's not even natural for the rider to have stirrups hung too far back this way. Our Western speed riding, with all its flopping around, losing stirrups, hanging on the horn, is not even basically the same as race, polo, jump, and contest bronc riding. Our stock saddles just have too many counterfeit riding qualities. Even hanging on the saddle horn does not offer enough security. Whoa, horse. It's sure a battle to stay astraddle on a counterfeit riding saddle. Here's Marty Wood, three times world champion bronc rider. Hanging his stirrups way up front this way is ordinarily unusable, rough, and homemade. When used as a regular stock saddle, a rodeo bronc rider saddle hurts horses' backs, has many defects and faults. Let's take out these faults, smooth it up to make it work right by redesigning the methods for hanging stirrups and rigging, and build us a regular stock saddle with common sense riding qualities. This saddle will be so different from old counterfeit riding stock saddles that it will have to have a new name. Let's call it a balanced ride. The first riding quality we need is that the stirrups hang up front of the girth in the rider's groove close to the horse's elbows. We want them to swing too so we aren't hobbled. To make the saddle stay on the horse's back for regular usage, the rigging must be moved forward and set way up high, where more bulk can be absorbed by the rider's leg muscles, not under his knee bone. The rigging must be spread out, bulkless as possible, and stronger than any other rigging. Counterfeit seats are way high in front, easier to build, heavier due to piles of extra leather. They put the rider's weight too immovably far back and hurt in his crotch. Balanced ride seats are low in front. Buckles must be below the rider's calf in order to let his knee through the lower calf fit close around the horse's barrel. This is where the grip and security are. With all this bulk gone from under the rider's knees and legs, 
The fender and stirrup leathers work smoothly over the rigging and do not catch or get back into the horse's flanks. Nor do they run away to the rear and dump the rider on her face. The stirrups are never stiff and hobbled. Use them from the shoulder all the way back to the cantle board. If you want to stand, you can acquire more security here than you've ever felt before. The rider needs the most security when he's up out of the saddle, but he can sit with more security too if his saddle has real riding qualities. Nearly all of my life I've worked with horses are on cow ranches in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Texas. Wish it were possible to have more motion pictures of my adventures, especially some of the cow work. But being a poor fellow, I could never afford movie cameras and film, and of course, I was always one of the peons who did the work. These films were made on the Richard King and Company ranch in South Texas. On most ranches, things are still mighty rough on cattle, horses, and humans. This ranch ran over 20,000 Santa Gertrudis cattle. Guess this is where we get the word cowpuncher. Mr. Robert Clayburg of the fabulous King Ranch of Kingsville originated and developed the Santa Gertrudis breed. Under the right circumstances, they can sure give a cowboy lots of thrills and are a real pleasure to work. That's my boss, Mr. Richard King III, in his vest. His cow brand was the HK Connected. He carried 30 Mexican cowboys and three of us Anglos the year round. This is a five-way cut and shoot. Here are the horse working peons, Alejandro Solis, following yours truly. Compare the ease and security of feed riding with the strained, hanging on, flopping around and stirrups of the barrel racers. Riding qualities of saddles makes the difference. Alejandro and I are a straddle of the first balanced ride saddles. These pictures were taken back in 1948. Here's a much younger, slimmer Monty Foreman working very accurately with the leads, doing rollbacks, 360s over the hocks. This is several years before our Western show judges and skeptical experts learned that footwork named leads even existed. Basically, horses are never really handleized until they can run and handle wide open and do it quietly. While training, we used to play follow the leader tag. You go through the same places as the leader. If you can pass, you pat him on the back, as Alejandro does here, and it makes him the new leader. Once and only once, I accidentally patted the lady just a little bit low, and doggone she didn't run my horse into a mesquite tree. Like to kill me. Talk about fun a horseback. You've never ridden until you can do it this way. Alejandro nearly has a wreck going over a gopher town. You can see that the horses are in the game too and enjoying it. Sure not nervous and excited. Sometimes we get confused as to who it was. The lady riding with us is Doreen Norton of California and Canada. She came down to visit, brought a movie camera and lots of film. We made motion pictures of our horse work, learned so much that it got us into this performance research business. Movies have also enabled me to demonstrate and prove to our skeptic experts that the footwork leads are the keys to the horse's agility. Alejandro and I in a free-for-all. I ran him out of bounds and now he'll try to catch me. Notice the riding, much more difficult than barrel racing. But here there's no strain, hanging on the saddle horn, flopping around and losing stirrups. This is riding as it should be. Doreen gets after us to quit the slow glumpity glump stuff and get yonderly. So we open them up. I'm leaning forward and kicking back when I get the idea to do a 360 over the hocks, but I forgot to tell Alejandro. It don't matter. Well, there was the difficult speed ride and made plumb easy by a few common sense riding qualities built into your saddle. Let's do another very difficult thing. Ride and stop standing up instead of sitting down and rearing back. Here's one of our unadopted daughters, Patricia Haynes, on two horses belonging to clinic students. Patty has never even seen these horses before, but will attempt to stop them 
foreman style. That means getting good calf roping horse stops going wide open. Patty gets him down just a little better each time. She meets the stop impact by standing up with lots of grip and security. Another secret for stops like this, of course, is in the rein checking. The horses do not get their front feet high in the air, laying stiff-legged or propped. Try standing up to stop on old counterfeit riding saddles. Patty neither tips forward or falls back to the rear. Half rope and horse stop on a reining horse. How about that? Of course, Patty Haynes is demonstrated on a balanced ride saddle. Now let's study the stops on old regular stock saddles with their counterfeit riding qualities. At the time these films were made, very few riders anywhere could stop better. These riders are all champions, riding champions, during reining contests. The rider almost has to sit down and rear back to pull on the horse and meet the stopping impact. The horses slide a little behind, but land stiff-legged and propped in front. You can sit down, rear back, and pull the horse's head clean upside down. You slide a little, then the front legs hit stiff-legged. Front leg prop stop is mighty rough. Look how the rider's tail bounces. These horses are not even running fast. Patty Haynes was doing running stops. The horse's front legs get too high, come down stiff-legged, and the rider bounces. If you sit down and rear back, it's almost impossible for horses to stop balance. They land stiff-legged, and there your tail goes, into the air. It's almost unbelievable, but our stops can sure stand some improving. Only motion pictures could prove so conclusively the troubles that we have on counterfeit riding saddles. When he was only 18 years old, Gary Foreman won the Pinto National Working Championship on two horses. He's leading high point halter and all around working champion, Wade's Poker War Leo, and riding the national senior reigning champion, Warrior's Dream. The Foreman style stops helped in winning his championships. Notice Gary's riding and the way the horse stops. These movies are slightly in semi-slow motion. So if you want these good calf roping horse stops, you must be able to stand in your stirrups with lots of grip and security. It's unfortunate that we had to show that stops could be improved, but nobody would believe it unless we used champions in contests. Most of these champions filmed are now honorary Riders Association members and summer directors. These motion pictures have helped them to greatly improve. The things that have been done on old counterfeit riding saddles is amazing. Think what is going to be done on saddles with rideability. A word of warning, my first balanced ride saddle was expensive, $15,000. It took 10 years to get rid of a bunch of faults and defects that were new to our saddle makers. To build balanced rides, instead of being obstinate, stubborn, hard-headed, chronically habitual, traditional, and, and predatory like the majority, our saddle makers has to be absolutely open-minded, an inventor, engineer, scientist, and almost a genius with the patience of Job. For your protection, balanced ride is a U.S. registered trademark, and only saddles advertised and stamped with a balanced ride trademark are your guarantee. We hope you've enjoyed this riding by reasoning and can bring you more facts you, that you can see, feel, use, analyze, and enjoy. This is Monty Foreman saying, for the Riders Association, adios, amigos. <laughs>
There are so many saddles on the market, but the bottom line for most riders is comfort and security. They want the same for their horses. We visited a saddle maker that feels the same way. For years, I said a wooden saddle tree only fits a wooden horse. And, and the theory is, is that we're trying, and I did years ago, trying to fit a, a wooden object that, that stayed in one particular shape to an animal that is going to be in a dynamic motion and move. And what was brought up to my attention with some veterinarians are saying, well, we have these three machines, the thermography and the ultrasound, the computerized pad. Why don't we see how well this is working with you? Some of the results when we first started out with this was not something I wanted to see. But because I won and I loved my horse, I wanted to do something better. I knew that if I could make those three machines happy, it was definitely going to work for the horse. Okay, what we have here is a traditional wooden rawhide bound saddle tree. And we're going to pretend that it's a horse that, that the saddle tree basically doesn't fit. And we'll get him out of the way. Um, what happens is that because it's bridging and only touching in the front and the back, you can see as I get up here with my body weight that it doesn't change shape. And even if I used a, a particular pad or gel or whatever, it would still bridge on these four places. And that's when we come into the theory of the Boss Spring Flex Airflow Saddle Tree. The whole inside of the saddle tree is full of air. With the new Airflow Tree, it's on the same existing horse. We still have an inch and a half of gap underneath. Now as we put our body weight in it, it ends up bending and going down and trying to support the shape. And it not only gives long ways, but it also will give length ways. If I can grab it and pull hard enough, which I'm pretty strong, you can see that the, the tree would also give in the bar. And he's constantly changing shape through his back and through his shoulders. So we need something that changes as he changes, not something that fit him when he was standing still in the static form. What we've done now, because we have the, the, the flexible tree, I had to put one more system on it to help out the, the user of the saddle and help out the horse. So what we end up doing is sewing the hook of Velcro in the bottom of the skirt to take the place of the sheepskin. And then we designed a pad that we call a sponge comfort bar, and it has then the carpet put on the top. And because of that, we can peel and stick these different thicknesses of pads to fit different uh, designs of backs of horses. With this new system, we do not need the saddle blanket and the traditional pads that we always used on the back. It's already built into the saddle. They custom peel and stick. You can custom sand them. Uh, it's endless on what we can do. And because of that, you don't have a slippage of a saddle and a blanket that's always moving. With the new pad system, we have eliminated probably 85 to 90 percent of our back problems and been very happy with the product in my uh, versatile balance rhythm saddles, I wanted to get that rider at least seven inches farther forward. What we've done in this seat is we've made the front half low and the back half high, which if you rolled a marble would roll forward and stay in what we call the center of gravity or the riding circle. If you got a teeter-totter and you put a sawhorse in the middle and you made it go back and forth, as long as you were sitting directly over the sawhorse and we put the teeter-totter on a machine that would go 50 miles per hour, 100 miles per hour, as long as you were sitting at the sawhorse, you don't care what the front and the back are doing. But as soon as we stop the machine and start to move you back from that position or forward and this teeter-totter starts going, then you've got to do a lot of work to try to stay there. And what we're doing on the horse, like the jumper and the polo and the, and the uh, saddle bronc riders and the, and the jockey, they're riding at the center of that saw horse so that the front and back are doing all different types of things, but they float. They ride the horse, not the seat. We've taken the stirrup and V'd it like a saddle bronc saddle, and this V effect makes the stirrup lock in position. Once he split them into a V, he had more security than any other rider in the world. The next thing we've done is take away all the bulk that's underneath the leg with a big D-ring, about three wraps, two big old pads. It's equivalent of two two by four stuck under each knee. What we're trying to do is get this so that the rider is close up against the horse with nothing underneath his knee and so that the contact that he has between the stirrup leather and his leg against the horse is tremendous. She's left lead, left lead, left lead and out of left lead. This is 60 days on this young horse and you'll notice the horse is very quiet. 
It's hard for people to see that we take horses in 30 days, 60 days and do something that somebody says that it's impossible to do that. And I said, yeah, when I used to ride in that position and I used to have that wooden tree dig into his back and I used to have uh, the bits that crushed his tongue or whatever, um, I always said it was my horse and really it was me causing the problems. And as soon as I deleted those problems, then the horse was saying, well, just get up off me, ride me, not the seat and watch how easy I do the lead changes, watch how easy I stop, watch how easy I roll, watch how easy I follow that cow. And I'm going, this is absolutely a miracle. And the horse was saying, no, it's not a miracle. You're finally leaving me alone. We're working as a team now instead of him being, uh, I'm the sergeant and he's the private. Today we use the old world's craftsmanship, but most of my saddle is done all by hand. Sometimes we do use a machine on, on different parts, but most of it's done by hand. Most of the um, saddle builders today take these little rollers that have a, a dot punch and they will roll that right along that scribe and you'll see that it just makes little teeny holes but we use pricking irons and this is the craftsmanship that is being lost today these little teeth are on a diagonal and what happens is that we punch it we move it and this is where we get that beautiful stitch that you'll see on that saddle once you hand stitch and you have an awl and two needles, the, the thread go in and out like a serpentine. And if one of those busted and come loose, the other one that's going through the holes is still holding it. It's never pulling on thread on thread. They want the quality. They want the craftsmanship. They want something that's going to last them 50, 60 years. And, and that's what I build. Naturally, a horse has a tremendous amount of um, balance and support and, and agility. And I find we, we hold them up in the position that we ride. And if we can get the riders that seven inches farther forward in that correct position, they'll start getting confidence. And they're saying, hey, I'm not afraid. I don't lose my stirrups like I used to. I don't feel like he's